we're ready to rock and roll for this October's lovely Cocktails and Fishtails presentation. My name is Stina Troyer. I'm the science specialist for Harbor Wild Watch and your host tonight for this science social that we've been virtually bringing to you throughout the pandemic times. So um, happy full moon. I hope you all have some fun october -y things planned. For those of you who are tuning in, we would love to know in the comments where you're tuning in from, who's watching with you, and if you're enjoying any tasty beverages tonight. Um, I have to give a shout out to our Rockfish collaborators at Powell Marine Research Group uh, for a Christmas beer for a while. I've been saving this for this occasion um, to talk rockfish with you all. Um, and of course, we have Andrea here, and we uh, will be learning about how robots and rockfish recovery kind of work together. But before we, you know, dive into the good stuff, we have to know what is your favorite cocktail, and will you share with us a wild fish tale? Yes. Uh, in reflecting on this question, I feel like a seasonal cocktail, but it feels like a Manhattan is always in season. So probably a Manhattan. Um, Fishtail, um, again, in thinking about this a lot, I have some pretty average fishtails, um, but an ROV related fishtail is I had been piloting our ROV for about a month and was not a fully competent ROV driver or pilot. And I'm not sure you could say I am still, but that's beside the point. Um, and I had finished a transect and this was in Hood Canal. And um, one of the things that we frequently do is rather than pull the ROV all the way to the surface, move it to the next station and drop it again. If the station's close enough, we will just had the station on the bottom. So we turned all the recording off. We had just the tracking on and I was heading as fast as possible to the next station along the bottom while still maintaining eye contact on the bottom. And there was junk on the bottom and that happens pretty frequently. There are humans around Hood Canal so you get junk on the bottom. And at one point I saw something coming and I my brain said washing machine and you see a lot of junk. And then that split second brain reaction of oh my gosh, it's a six gill. <laughs> and it was the first six gill we had ever seen. And my former boss was sitting next to me and he is a shark biologist by training and a big six gill aficionado. I start squealing um, <laughs> <laughs> because the thing, it just literally swam up to the front of the ROV, kind of peered its eye into the camera, turned its full body to the side and just kept swimming. And as an inexperienced ROV pilot, my first thought was, oh no, the video's not running. We're not capturing this. We've never seen one before. And Dave said the first person who gets, who sees one gets a, a beer on him. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm scrambling to hit all these buttons and just forgot to, we have a thing called auto heading. And if you're no autopilot, it just goes in one direction. So you can hear me on the old audio saying, I can't turn it. So you can see this video of this six scale every you know second or two as I'm trying to get the ROV to turn. And in retrospect, um, probably should have handed over the controls to someone who was a little less amped than I was, but it was pretty exciting. This is what is, I imagine like in the deep sea where you know you have the biologist <laughs> on the camera. And I'm so thankful that they have the audio record it because you just hear this like gleeful nerding out I like imagine you uh, doing that it's as well. like the the moment they got the video started you can just hear me squealing I'm like ah! um not super impressive on my part but something similar has happened to the I think it's the Nautilus crew that had a sperm whale come in wow. on their video and there was similarly a a scientist who is also clearly other people were trying to play cool and I think it's just not fun to play cool oh yeah just be let, excited let those emotions fly <laughs> yeah uh, which might be for those uh, folks who have tuned in uh, we would love to know uh, can you share with us in the comments maybe a time that nature's made you squeal <laughs> fun to hear some of those stories too so um, and of course uh, that comment section is the perfect place for you to write in any questions you have as we go along with tonight's presentation. Um, and uh, I will field all those questions 
Andrea's way at the end and you can have those questions answered live, which is a pretty cool, fun feature for these presentations. So with that, I think we'll, uh, I guess a note, we'll do some announcements at the end of the presentation about some upcoming events. You can look forward to some salmon tours in person, some live peer into the nights, all that good stuff. So we'll go ahead and kind of get our technology squared away. I'm gonna spotlight you and let you share your screen. All right. And then, oh, where's the spotlight? Uh, we'll go ahead and get <clears throat> rocking and rolling. All right, can you see that screen? We got gotcha. you. Awesome. Can you see the pointer? <laughs> um, yes, I can see the red, the red pointer awesome. there. You're, you're all set. So okay. thank you so much for joining us. And I'll call you. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Andrea Hennings. I am a ground fish biologist, and I will just say that up front, ground fish and and bottom fish are gonna be used interchangeably, not because um, there isn't a difference, but because I just tend to use them interchangeably. Ground fish is anything that lives on or near the bottom. And in Puget Sound, or at least in Washington state, bottom fish are anything within a certain Washington regulation structure. So if you hear those two different words, I'm meaning bottom fish the way that we mean it in terms of regulatory, um, in terms of rules. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about rockfish. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our ROV and hopefully if you have some questions at the end, please feel free to ask them. I am happy to answer. And also let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So my work unit is responsible for research and monitoring of all bottom fish species in Puget Sound. Um, and like I said, bottom fish is a regulatory term and rockfish are a group of fish within bottom fish, and they are really of particular interest for our group. Um, there are about 28 species of rockfish in Washington state waters, and about half of those um, are pretty common, or, um, or let's say not rare in Puget Sound. Um, you can see some pictures here of um, six of those species. They range in size, color, shape, um, but each species is really important within the Puget Sound ecosystem. And as a group, they exhibit a wide variety of life histories and occupy a wide range of habitats from pretty shallow water reefs that are diveable to really deep walls. Um, and some of those species, very few of them are found on soft mud or sand. Um, and that unique ecology of each of those species is important to be understood and needs to be considered when we think about how we manage fisheries and conduct research. So uh, well, I noted that these fish are um, a pretty diverse group. They actually share quite a few characteristics. Um, recruitment is generally pretty variable. And by recruitment, I mean baby fish are born, they settle out on the bottom, they become fish. Um, in a lot of years, rockfish don't have a lot of babies um, and they can have baby booms. And that's usually, um, we think environmentally um, programmed, but um, uh, generally speaking, individual survival can be pretty low. Um, they become sexually mature at relatively old ages. So um, Puget Sound rockfish that you see here, these guys mature at a year, which is not particularly old, but this yellow eye here, um, they generally are about 20 years old by the time that they start having babies. So not young. Um, they live really long lives. Generally speaking, this Puget Sound rockfish can live around 22 years. Um, and these guys don't get very big, but um, these guys do, the yellow eye, and these guys can live up to 120 or so years. Uh, most of these species don't move long, long distances as adults. They, gen to settle, they tend to settle out on the bottom and hang out um, in the same area for most of their lives. Um, and then another thing about them that is really important from a fisheries perspective is that they have this fancy term for their swim bladders, um, their physoclistus. That means that their, their swim bladders, the things that they use to maintain buoyancy while they're swimming are closed. And 
that's a problem because it's really hard for them to get rid of some of the gas in that swim bladder if you take them to the surface really quickly. Um, and the deeper the depth, more frequently you'll get them looking like a balloon when you get to the surface. And that can cause real injury, it's called barotrauma. Um, and all of those factors make them really susceptible to over harvest. So if you find a rock with some rockfish on it, um, it can be really easy to remove the fish that live there. Um, and like I said about recruitment, sometimes it can take a while for those fish to move more fish to repopulate that area. Um, and in Puget Sound, rockfish weren't a super popular uh, commercial fishery or recreational fishery until about the 1960s and 70s. So not that long ago. And then they quickly became a favorite target in addition to or instead of salmon. Um, and once it was clear that harvest limits were necessary in the 80s and the early 90s, it became clear that rockfish in Puget Sound were becoming depleted. And by 2009, rockfish fishing was closed in Puget Sound, and we ultimately had three species, uh, including the yellow eye that you see here, um, were listed, and not that fish, all yellow eye, <laughs> uh, were listed on the endangered species list. So if my unit, who is responsible for doing research and management on these fish, wants to conduct some targeted research um, in all life histories, we have to think creatively about how to find these fish and then count them in the habitats that they live. Um, our unit conducts a yearly trawl survey that focuses on species that occur on flat bottoms. Um, uh, and that's in shallow and in deep water, but as I've noted, rockfish don't regularly occur in those habitats. And then we also have a dive program that uh, assesses fish in water to about depths of 100 feet, but rockfish can go much, much deeper. Um, and because of that status of the multiple species in Puget Sound that are depleted, we want to reduce our survey impacts, especially given their susceptibility to this barotrauma. And we would prefer not to have to catch the fish, but instead, count them where they live on a regular basis. And then finally, one of the things that we need more information on is rockfish habitat. So where do they live? Um, Puget Sound is a pretty unique place geologically, oceanographically, and ecologically. And we wanna know more about the characteristics of the habitat these fish prefer. So ultimately we decided we needed a new way to survey for rockfish. Enter. An ROV. Um, this ROV we have called the yellow eye. It's yellow. It has a camera, which is kind of like an eye, yellow eye, very creative. Uh, it was originally purchased in 2008 for some invertebrate surveys. Um, and that didn't pan out very well. And this is about the time that we needed to fill this gap for rockfish uh, recovery, uh, specifically research for rockfish recovery. So we said, sure, we will test it out. Um, ultimately, what we'll get to, spoiler alert, is this is a really great tool for finding rockfish. Um, this particular model is a CI Falcon. It's actually owned by Saab. So if you have a Saab car or know somebody that does, made by the same people. Um, this particular model is rated to dive to 300 meters. That's a pressure rating. Um, and fortunately, Puget Sound proper is about 950 feet. So this thing can go all the way to the bottom of Puget Sound. Um, we drive it around um, utilizing there are four propellers that move it front to back, side to side, and there's a single vertical thruster. Um, and what's really cool about this particular model is that you can spin it rather than having to go forward like this, like you're trying to parallel park the car. Um, Actually, I would like that installed on my car. Um, and we send it power in communication down this yellow umbilical here, and it streams video and data back up to us on the support vessel. These are our awesome technicians, Katie, Ian, uh, just for a size comparison. So, so this is not a very big ROV. Um, there are other ROVs that you might be more familiar with, like uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust, who have Hercules and Argus that they run off their Nautilus research vessel. Um, but our ROV can't quite hold as much fancy stuff. Um, what you see here is a fancy LED light package um, that our friends at NOAA helped us put together. Um, that helps light up the seafloor out in front of the ROV. 
there is a sonar here and that helps us see if there's something like a rock in front of us that we want to head toward or occasionally you'll run into something that's not on the map and maybe there's a sunken ship so that sonar helps us get there um, we also have a tracking system that is integrated on the rov and that helps us know where the rov on the bottom at all times um, and that's there's some fancy math involved. Just know that there are some software that helps us decode that. We're actually able to then um, plot those tracks in a geographic information system. So we can know later, not only where this ROV has been, but if we have the timestamps, we know what we've seen along that track line. And finally, we can put a lot of fancy equipment on this, even though it's pretty small, she is mighty. Um, we can put on GoPros, we've had water quality equipment like CTDs, um, and now that things are becoming much smaller, this thing can hold a lot of stuff. Um, really, the sky's the limit. A really quick note, I was reflecting on this, a lot of the pictures that you're going to see in this presentation are not from this primary camera. This camera is standard definition, and if those of you who know what a VCR is or <laughs> have a uh, had a tube TV, that's kind of the era of this, of this camera. So this video quality is not as good, but we have been able to put on some additional cameras. So that's where a lot of these pictures that you're seeing today are coming from. This is our new to us research vessel. The ROV lives back here. Um, this boat was purchased in 2019 after our very much loved and used older research vessel was ready to retire. Um, Again, the stern is the business end, and we launched the ROV using a telescoping crane here. In addition to this umbilical here, you can see that there's another line here. This is relevant because this is just part of the ROV operations. Um, this is a clump weight. This helps just keep this umbilical straight down the bottom so that ROV can move around on the bottom and do what we needed to do rather than tugging around an umbilical. All right. Currently, there are four of us in the crew who are ROV pilots, and we take turns operating it. It is actually pretty mentally tasking. It's not programmed. You have to drive it, kind of like a video game. Um, in the left image here, um, you can see this top monitor here is seeing what the ROV sees, and there are some data streams that are coming in around it. Um, the other computer and monitor here are for our tracking software and our sonar output for the pilot to see and operate. Um, and you can see my colleague Jen here driving the ROV and that sonar feeds just above her shoulder so she can check and see if anything hard is coming out in the distance. We also have a co-pilot station and this was actually a COVID protocol that um, has now probably become a permanent addition. Um, the co-pilot's responsibility is ultimately making sure that you're running the tracking system correctly, you're operating the sonar, calling out something that the ROV pilot might have missed, and then most importantly, keeping notes. And finally, call out to this man here. This is Mark, he is our captain. Um, Mark is sitting in his chair, monitoring everything that's going on in front of him. And one of the special things about what we do is that we are live boating. So Mark is not anchored. He is operating the vessel and trying to keep it near the ROV at all times because while what we are doing is super important, nothing can be done without Mark. Um, it's kind of like a dance. We try not to step on each other's toes. Um, generally that works out really well. And that is primarily because Mark is a super skilled captain and uh, he's very patient. So what does the ROV see? How, you know how we use it up top, but what does the ROV see on the bottom? Um, I'm gonna play a little video, hope it works. Um, let's see, nope. Going back. Let's see if this works. All right, there we go. This is Z's Reef. Um, I initially chose this because it's probably the best video of rockfish that's as close to Gig Harbor as possible. Then I realized this is also a really good video to highlight where the trade-offs exist between choosing survey methods. Um, this is shallow water. This is diveable. Steen has been here. Um, one thing you'll notice right away in this video is it's super green. Um, we can still make out that these are copper 
and uh, brown rockfish. We can still get counts of these fish. We generally try not to operate the ROV in areas where divers can go just because the video quality is not as good. And when you're trying to rely on those species identifications and counts um, for management purposes, we're trying to control as many factors of bias as possible. In shallow water, there can also be seaweeds, don't want to turn it into a vegematic. You can blow stuff out the back of the ROV pretty quickly. Additionally, there are a couple perch in here as we've moved along. We don't do that data analysis on perch, but maybe someone in the future can, and that is a major benefit of recording video. Uh, second, this video is really short, so I'll keep it short. These are sharp chin rockfish. Um, this is not something we had assumed that was going to happen when we got an ROV, and that's specifically documenting a species that is not really well uh, represented in historical records. Um, before we started using an ROV, we thought they were primarily a coastal species. They occasionally showed up, but there are actually pockets of them around Puget Sound that we now see in our data. Um, the ROV is able to sample them in habitats where other methods cannot find them. And finally, really quickly, Hood Canal, um, super special place. And I share this because it gives me a lot of hope. Um, this is an example of an area with relatively high rockfish densities. Um, and apologies, this video is a little moving pretty quickly. Um, these are mostly Quillback and Copper rockfish. But what you think, oh, oh no, the video is not going to come back. What I was going to tell you is the things that they're hanging out on there were sponges. Um, they're hexactinellid sponges, and those sponges were not found until relatively recently. Those particular sponges um, in that video were dead. We've seen them alive. But one of the things that we had talked about is we really wanted a methodology that was going to help us find these rockfish habitats. And um, the rockfish are using these sponges as habitats, and that's really important to know, and that's something that we wouldn't have gotten had we not had an ROV. So let's see if we can get this to advance. So. Advantages of using an ROV. Can they survey rockfish in their preferred habitats? Yes, they can. Um, we can do so in a low impact way so we don't have to hurt rockfish when we want to survey them. And then also we can collect some of that really critical habitat information. Um, and while I didn't add it to a slide, um, one of those things I noted about those sharp chins is it's a challenge, it's, it's a platform that's really helped us challenge some of these existing assumptions about species distributions in Puget Sound. Um, there are disadvantages, just like any type of survey that you're going to do. Visual surveys only quantify what you observe. So you saw in some of those videos that the habitat's pretty complex. Fish like to live in cracks. I am never going to see that fish. However, pretty much no other way of getting to that fish um, for a survey methodology is going to happen unless it's probably dead. So I feel okay about that right now. Um, another thing that we have to worry about for that uh, observed part is that if the visibility is low or the video resolution is poor, there are species that are cryptic, so that means that they look like their habitats. If we don't see it, we can't count it. Um, another thing that I didn't go into is that um, we don't have an automated way of watching these videos. So I started out reviewing this video, annotating it and putting it in a database. I now supervise people who are doing that and I check their work, but it's really, really time intensive to do that work. Um, we record it in the field. We take it back to the, the office, now people's homes, and they're doing that work in their house and it just takes some time. And then one of the other disadvantages is that these are virtual fish, don't have a physical sample, so I can't collect any data on age structures to know how old they are. I can't collect genetic material. I'm not collecting links. Those are things that we're working on through additional methods, but that's not something that we can do right now. And then finally, there are some just other little things you might have noticed that the ROV tends to either scare some rockfish and then it might attract some fish. Um, that's something else that we are working on as part of our methodology, and I can talk more if you have questions about that, but it's something that a lot of surveys deal with, but we just happen to be able to see. So I, I, knowing that people had cocktails in their hands, or a beer, or a water, uh, 
I kept the math out of this, but if you are somebody who wants to know more details and I don't answer your question here, if you have one, we do have some tech publications on our website. Um, and I have listed both the website here. And then if you search for remotely operated vehicle, don't search for ROV, it won't come up. So um, currently we have three reports that are up on the website. Um, those are based on surveys that we have done for some of this initial work looking at scoping the ROV um, as a potential um, survey platform. And then we have one here that is comparing our ROV survey to our trawl survey to say, are there differences? And spoiler alert, there are. And then um, another um, publication that was from our 2010 survey in the San Juans looking at um, some improvements on our survey design. We have a couple more coming up, always more work to be done. Um, and spoiler alert, again, we've got a new ROV. So we are going to hopefully put this other ROV to bed. And the new ROV is a little bit fancier. It's gonna help us do some additional things, including improving that video quality. And we will hopefully build on that uh, in the next few years. And the yellow eye says, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> This is where we get to say your presentation rocked, <laughs> <laughs> which the the rocking like rock on also ends up being a pretty good uh, survey method for that three inch. Yes, like, okay, it does. Little, rock picture, <laughs> they rock. Um, I love that. Other than that, it's good to go. Um, so yeah, it looks like we had. I know uh, we did end up having a diver tune in. Hey, they? they're uh, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There. Maybe we can get her in on a on a scuba survey. Awesome, really a pretty special spot. Um, while of course this is the time for those of you who are watching, uh, please type your comments into the or well comments and questions into the comments. Uh, we're happy to field those over, and it looks like Anthony is also tuning in, who's another diver. Um, so. Yeah, this is my opportunity to be like, yes, plugging rockfish surveys, come come do some science. And um, in addition to these awesome ROV uh, tracking. So I'm curious, uh, you mentioned the six skill shark at the very beginning of your presentation uh, and the sponges and some cool things. Are there some other creatures that have just been total surprises uh, that you've encountered on your, on your ROV adventures? I think the six skills, I almost said take the bait. That's terrible. Um, <laughs> they, we, we've now seen, I think, five or six, six skills. And my colleague Jen and I were driving in Hood Canal. Spoiler alert, her Hood Canal is pretty good for six skills. Um, we saw two within the space of a few minutes. Um, and those have been pretty special. Um, we've also seen, if you take the ROV out of its homeland of Puget Sound proper. So anywhere Admiralty Inlet South or kind of the San Juan Islands, if you start taking it out toward the coast, we've seen um, we've seen a Pacific Ocean perch, which is an oceanic rockfish species or more frequently encountered out there. We have seen, um, I think a rose thorn in the San Juans, which was weird. And part of this is, you know, you don't have the fish in hand. So it sometimes is a bit of a question mark. So we're really fortunate that there is a, a bunch of people out there who also use ROVs. And so if you can't get an answer from one, you just pass it to the next and it can help. So I think those are pretty good. I think octopus are always really cool. You can always see when an octopus has been somewhere because there's like shell vomit all over the place underneath a hole. So that's pretty great. So usually we'll sit down and see if anybody's home, but I'm sure at the end, I'll think of something, but the six skills are pretty special. I love, I love the term shell vomit as a way, as one of your little observation just... <laughs> indicators. I'm going to use that it's... going forward. I could just imagine them just sitting there, just chucking all of the crab shells or yeah, just it's like a little midden right out in front of their house. It's pretty great. Keep the house clean, but the yard. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. Um, we definitely have some highs and hellos coming in. <laughs> Jenny, she's getting pumped. She's going to come do some rocket <laughs> surveys with us. So that's a win in my book. Uh, of course, we would love more questions. Uh, <laughs> get curious out there, folks. What are you wondering about 
uh, the power of robots and rockfish. I think there's definitely some cool, cool implications there. So I, I will I will say that one of the things we see more than rockfish, as we have just talked about, um, we have put this thing down on um, sunken ships that we know that they're there intentionally. We have also occasionally run into ships that we didn't know were there. Ooh. All of it is really good rockfish habitat, but sometimes it's the kind of stuff that makes you a little surprised because Puget Sound is not well mapped. Um, especially at deeps deeper than what a cargo ship might hit. So um, that is one of our major barriers to doing additional, what we call species distribution modeling, is we just don't have really good maps of the bottom of Puget Sound, which just seems weird because it's so populated, but it's something that we are working on. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of weird stuff at the bottom of Puget Sound. It's better to find it with the ROV though, and not a trail net. <laughs> I was, when you were saying you thought the, the six skill was going to be a washing machine initially, uh, I'm sure you've actually encountered washing machines, which is we've, kind of an important we've, <laughs> we've seen washing machines, we've seen refrigerators, we have seen, you know, as somebody who owns a boat, I have seen not only many boats, but lots of outboards. So, you know, that person had a really bad day. We've yeah. seen uh, people's fishing gear. So their entire uh, downrigger uh, with the pole still attached, like down the way. Um, we've seen, we have seen a kitchen sink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you really can't say all that in the kitchen all sink. All that in the kitchen sink. Yeah, my boss said that on the audio. And we're like, yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I know uh, this is, I feel like such a perfect program for us going into the fall because, you know, we're kicking off these monthly rockfish surveys for those who are scuba certified as well as our peer into the night programs, which we have our own little yellow submarine ROV that we uh, use to you know, follow along with the scuba divers. And I know we get ourselves into trouble whether we're wrapping the cord around the pilings or <laughs> like not able to drive it because the current's too strong. Um, yeah. Are there some technical ROV difficulties that you've had to problem solve or have you encountered totally those? totally yeah um we're throwing a lot of electrical equipment into salt water so that is usually the most common problem is if something's not tightened enough or if you haven't um, put enough silicone grease on something you can either get electrolysis or in some cases you know it's never been since I've been working for the agency, but I think this exact ROV at one point, someone didn't tighten uh, what's called a vent. So as the ROV goes down, same thing with the rockfish, the pressure increases. And so if something's not tightened, you're gonna get water intrusion and someone did not tighten a vent and it got into the brain box and went, and that, you know, that happens in all sorts of surveys, but it, you know, it's, it's a bummer when it happens. Um, We've had that type of stuff happen. And then um, to your point about current, sometimes you just can't operate the ROV in a heavy current, or if the boat is too far away, if the boat's dealing with the surface current, and that happens in places like the Narrows or um, Admiralty Inlet, we have to really plan surveys around the tides and the currents. And then that kind of third piece is, um, there's a lot of stuff on the bottom that our biggest, biggest problem is lines. Um, they tend to, if your crab pot has fallen off the shelf or has been dragged out to deeper water, but that buoy is still up in the water column somewhere, that line is still there. And so we've, we've wrapped the ROV umbilical specifically around lines. We've accidentally gotten under a commercial ground line that was in a high current area. So those are the type of things that um, give me a little bit of pause whenever I see something I don't want to see on the sonar, but we've, there are cables on the bottom of Puget Sound that are not laid within the area that they're supposed to be. So sometimes you'll see them off the bottom, <laughs> which is not great. Mm -hmm. And we have caught on those. Um, but fortunately, uh, most, most of us have gotten to the point where we're confident enough to figure out where those things are and um, how to avoid them. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> our lovely board member Howard has a very uh, humble question here. <laughs> He's a 
wondering, so when you retire the old ROV, uh, would you consider that to donating it to the Harbor Well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We, this is one of our, one of the things that our unit is talking about is we, we do a lot of education and outreach. Um, we take students out on our research vessel, specifically students. Um, but we were just having a discussion about that this morning. And let me tell you, Howard, it's not cheap to maintain an ROV, unfortunately, especially in people time, it's a lot. And so one of the things that we've talked about is there's um, some programs around where students um, might be getting, whether or not they're interested in the ROV specifically, maybe they're interested in electronics, maybe they're interested in operating a boat. So how can we get students involved in that process? And we are, we obviously can't just give away state resources, but I would love to talk with people about how they might integrate their interests into what we're doing and how we can help people understand what we're doing better and hopefully get them some exposure to what's going on in their local community and also more broadly within marine conservation. Well, I know we hope to be a catalyst for those people trying to you know get involved so I know you guys are doing uh, a great job we've been working with some students who have been doing some lab work with a blue water task force water sampling awesome. and uh Eamon was showing me pictures of the ROV that they were building so I feel like cool. you definitely could shuttle some students your way that would be interested in learning more so that's awesome there's so many great stem programs <laughs> yeah oh yeah. absolutely I'm like, I want to go back to high school and do all I these know. Cool, like ROV competitions. Like, yeah. Yes. Great. Yes. Very cool. Um, well, that is, um, I'm going to, I'm going to just, you know, kind of put it out there one more time. If you have any questions, get those in the comments before we wrap up here. Um, while we wait for maybe some more of those questions to come in, uh, I just have a couple announcements on the Harbor Wild Watch end of things. Uh, if you're feeling stoked about rockfish and you're a scuba diver, you can of course join our monthly rockfish trainings, which then are followed by a club dive hosted with Tacoma Scuba and, you know, put those survey practice to work and you can come count some baby rockfish in the, I guess, what's the not ROV suitable habitats, right? <laughs> Get out there and look in those tiny little cracks for fish that are less than three inches and do your best to identify, not to species, but whether they're, you know, that deep body fish or an elongate fish and whether or not they have a dorsal spot. So we're not asking you to be rockfish experts and zeros are important too. So I would be so thrilled to get more recreational divers out there, adding a little splash of science to your, to your scuba adventures. So uh, that, the next one's coming up on October 22nd, that is this Friday. It will be a night dive because at 6 p.m. it's already, you know, it is darker right now. So um, that requires an advanced certification, but would love to get you involved with that if you're a scuba diver out there. And um, following that, we also, if you're feeling stoked about ROVs, our Peer Into the Night uh, season is kicking off. I know we had some technical difficulties with our ROV. Uh, turns out, you know, over a year sitting unused, the battery died. So it got sent back to Texas. We are fairly confident it will be back in our paws for the November 6th event at 6 p.m. at Maritime Pier, which is right next to the Tides Tavern. So you can see our <laughs> one of our board members, Tom, operating that ROV while I get to spiel about what our divers and the ROV are seeing on a big screen projected live you get to you know have have a little bit of a personal experience while you get to hopefully stay dry I don't know you at least won't get salty because it could be raining we do this event I was gonna say rain or shine but it's more like moonshine uh, <laughs> than sunshine because these are of course they're happening at night but bundle up come out to the dock and uh, enjoy that show with us and then you can also get excited about salmon season with all this rain. If you're thinking, oh, the rain is awful. I want you to turn that attitude around and think, yay, happy salmon weather. Uh, Cause that rain is gonna be filling up those creeks for the return of our, our kind of late fall run of salmon. Uh, Donkey Creek will have chum running, we hope <laughs> uh, later, later in November. And so we're gonna start our live peek in the creek facebook videos um 
The first one will be October 29th at 3 p.m. So you can tune in for that. And then Rachel will be doing some other Creek in the Peaks on Friday mornings, kind of the beginning of November. Uh, we're not we're not going to work <laughs> on the Thanksgiving week, but we will be starting our in-person salmon tours at Donkey Creek um, that Saturday following Thanksgiving and doing that through the first Saturday of December. So check the website calendar for all these fantastic fun events. We'll get, uh, we get to be outside in person is kind of what we've decided with Harbor Wild Watch. We think we can, you know, maintain social distance. We'll still require masks just for comfortability sake. And, you know, it'll be nice to see faces again. And then of course, for our more, you know, events that would normally take place uh, in a, indoor venue we'll keep doing those virtually so stay tuned for more cocktails and fish tanks and oh we did get a question yay my long <laughs> spiel <laughs> I didn't get skunked. Yes. okay so penny is wondering do you ever come up to the anacortis area and do breakfast surveys totally we um do surveys all the way from the canadian border all the way down we've We've put it down in Dye's Inlet. Uh, there's a lot of mud. Um, so we go all over and we've actually done two surveys in Canada um, with Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So we've gone all the way up to uh, Desolation Sound with this ROV. Oh. And are you going out into the Straits of Juan de Fuca as well? That's the plan. That's, cool. well, I say that. <laughs> we've gone all the way out to Nia Bay. Um, but the bigger bow will hopefully allow us to poke our noses out a little further. Awesome. Oh, that's very cool. Um, yeah. And I guess I'm curious, uh, as far as kind of the question of determining what habitats rockfish prefer, mm -hmm. are you finding, like, I mean, rockfish, do they like rocks? Do they like that muddy bottom? Do they, they like They do. Rocks? You know, actually, yeah. one thing I did not say is that is actually... Rockfish like rocks, but there's not a lot of true rock in Puget Sound. It's a lot of um, glacial sediment and a lot of river outflow. So you, a lot of the stuff that these fish are hanging out in is a lot of muddy walls. Um, but one of the really cool things that we have seen is there are quillback that just hang out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the mud. And they're one of the classic rock rockfish. And so there's a question of why, but we're not quite sure why yet. So stay tuned. They, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't have something to do with hybridization, which they also do, but um, that's a whole other story. Well, how about that? <laughs> uh, keeping you on your toes there, yeah. Quillbacks. Thanks. Thanks for <laughs> um, well, it looks like uh, that's all for the questions to field your way live. Uh, I, of course, want to say, you rock. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual Cocktails and Fishtails presentation. It's uh, such a treat to be able to, you know, it's it's hard to move around from Seattle. So I think the virtual format definitely lets us branch out and talk to some really cool humans. And I'm glad that you got to be one of them. So very appreciative to have you. If we were in person, we'd, of course, give you a nice big toast and a huge round of applause. So uh, really appreciate you taking the time to teach us about the work that you're doing and uh, it's very very cool stuff so thanks to you thanks to everybody for tuning in yeah awesome all right well cheers everybody and we'll see you next month <laughs>